talk about um, Du Chatelet and the Leibniz Clark correspondence. And I want to do that um, for two reasons. One is because, as a philosopher of physics, this is a really, really important collection of letters. This is the kind of canonical starting point that, as philosophers of physics, we all kind of begin from when we start thinking about um, con the contemporary debate over space and time and motion and gravitation. So, for example, in Oxford, the undergraduate philosophy of physics course there begins in the first year with a term length seminar on the leibniz clark correspondence. So this is where we all start um, as philosophers of physics. So it has this very important place in um, philosophy of physics and in the ongoing debates about space, time, motion and gravity all the way through to Einstein and beyond. And so thinking about um, Du Chatelet, how she responds to the issues that she sees in the leibniz clark correspondence is, is something that is one way of kind of thinking about her place and her importance for debates that are already of interest and already kind of where we have a narrative. Um, so I want to think about, so I think she has some really, really interesting things to say and a very, very important place in this narrative. So I want to say a few things about that. And then the other reason why the leibniz clark correspondence is so important is because she had it very, very early. So it's possibly the very first thing that she read where she's reading Leibniz's own words. So I think it's important as we kind of get more deeply into Du Chatelet's scholarship and we're interested in the chronology and the development of her thoughts, just to go back and see what is in the Leibniz Clark correspondence and what's not in it in terms of this very early exposure to Leibniz's own writings about his ideas. So I want to say a little bit about that as well. So those are the two things that I want to talk about. Um, and in the background, there are some sort of methodological um, um, issues about <coughs> where we're at in Du Chatelet scholarship and this kind of conference and the other workshop that you have coming up where we're thinking about Du Chatelet in relation to other philosophers, what kind of work that is um, and how different ways of going about it. Um, so I'm going to stick to talking about space, time and motion as, the, as topics within the leibniz clark correspondence that are important for philosophy of physics. So this is going to pick up nicely on um, Jeff talk, Jeff's talk from yesterday. Um, and I'm going to start by with a quote that we saw yesterday from Leibniz. Um, so I'm going to fall right into the trap that um, Jeff said that we shouldn't fall into yesterday. And maybe I'll say a few things about why I think that's a, it's an OK trap to fall into um, as we go along. So here's um, Leibniz. We saw this yesterday. I hope I hold space to be something purely relative an order of existences, for space denotes in terms of possibility, an order of things which exist at the same time, considered as existing together, without inquiring into their manner of existing. There need not be any real and absolute being answering to that idea, distinct from the mind and from all relations. Abstract space is that order of situations when they are conceived as being possible. Space is therefore something ideal. So this is just to remind you some of the things that Leibniz says in his letters. Um, and his, he's targeting his opponents here who he says take space to be a substance or at least an absolute being. So famously he says, I have many demonstrations to confute the fancy of those who take space to be a substance or at least an absolute being. But I shall only use at the present one demonstration which the author here gives me occasion to insist upon. I say then, that if space was an absolute being, there would be something happen for which it would be impossible there should be a sufficient reason, which is against my axiom, and I prove it thus. And then he gives his east-west argument, this argument where if there was absolute space, then God could have, could have created all the same material relations among things, but reversed east-west, and there would be no observable difference. That's against his axiom, so there can't be any such thing as absolute space, roughly speaking. Um, so here's how Du Chatelet begins her chapter on space, and we saw this yesterday. Some have said, space is nothing over and above things. It is a mental abstraction, an ideal being. It is nothing other than the order of things as they coexist, and there is nothing to space except bodies. Others have, on the contrary, maintained that space is an absolute being, real and distinct from the bodies it contains, an intangible, penetrable extension lacking solidity, the universal vessel that receives the bodies that are placed in it. Um, so here's the, here's the natural reading that um, Jeff mentioned yesterday. Go, oh, that looks like she's characterizing these two positions from the Leibniz-Clark correspondence. 
Um, and then a little later on, she endorses Leibniz's east-west argument against absolute space. So she says, certainly if one consults the principle of sufficient reason that I established in the first chapter, one cannot help but acknowledge that Mr. Leibniz was right to banish absolute space from the universe and to regard the idea that several philosophers believe they have as an illusion of the imagination. Um, so I think that it's quite straightforward from these passages that um, she is endorsing the Leibniz picture. Now I completely agree with Jeff that what's going on in the background here is the argument about um, atomism versus the plenum, so atoms and the void versus the plenum, and the idea in Cartesian philosophy that um, if you have, that we don't have an idea of space that's distinct from our idea of body. Right? That there's something conceptually problematic about the idea of the void. And you see this in some of the people that um, Du Chatelet was reading. Um, so Muschenbrook, for example, of his first step in talking about absolute space that he endorses is to argue that we do, in fact, have an idea of the void as distinct from body. And he's talking about the atomism versus plenum debate where, so the idea of the plenum in the Cartesian case is that we, we can't separate absolute space, the idea of absolute space from the idea of the, the idea of body. So all of that is in the background and she is talking about that and after Jeff's talk yesterday, I was thinking some more about this kind of, maybe she's making a kind of interesting move here and putting these things together in the way that she is and so I went, had a quick look last night, went back to look at Skrazandi and Muschenbrook and people like this just to see and they don't do it quite like this and so I want to go back and look some more at these arguments, I think it's pretty interesting and I'm yeah, interested in your talk yesterday. Nevertheless, um, I think it's pretty clear that she is setting up the two positions um, that we see in the Leibniz Clark correspondence and that she's endorsing Leibniz's position against the Newtonian position about absolute space. Um, so let's go on very quickly and look at time. And Leibniz treats time in parallel with space in the leibniz clark correspondence. So again, this is just to remind you what he says. So he begins with space and says, space does not depend upon such or such situation of bodies, but it is that order which renders bodies capable of being situated and by which they have a situation among themselves when they exist together. And then here comes time in parallel, as time is that order with respect to their successive position. Then he gives his east-west argument about space and then says, the case is the same with respect to time. And he gives his argument about the beginning of the universe, where he says there can't be absolute time because if there was, then God could have created the entire material universe a thousand years earlier, whatever it is he says. But that would be a difference with no difference, so there can't be um, absolute time. So that's what he says about time. He treats it in parallel with space. And she seems to do the same at the beginning of her chapter on time. She says, the notions of time and space are very similar. In space, one simply considers the order of coexistence insofar as they coexist. And in time, the order of successive things insofar as they succeed each other, discounting any other internal quality than simple succession. Um, so I think it looks like at least for the metaphysics of things, she's just very, very quickly saying, you know, here's what the debate looks like, and I'm just, you know, I'm just following Leibniz on this. For the, so I'm going to be a relationist and not an absolutist about um, space and time. So, but these take up just a small portion of these chapters on space and time, and I don't think that's where her primary interest lies. I think she's much more interested. Um, in the, epistemology, in the epistemological questions associated with space and time, and that she moves her, so this is a different way of reading this chapter from what we heard yesterday from Jeff, and it's kind of exciting that we're getting to the point in the scholarship where we can start having these different readings and having these kinds of detailed discussions. So the way that I read the, the majority of the chapters on space and time is much more in an epistemological key, um, and something that um, Cho Lin, has um, emphasized is that um, Leibniz, with respect to space, um, raises this issue of how it is that we get our idea of space. And this is an issue that um, Du Chatelet would have been familiar with from Locke. It also occurs in Muschenbrook, as I realized last night when I was going back to look at him after Jeff's talk. This, you know, how is it that we get our idea of space? How do we form our notion of space? 
So I want to just remind you about what Leibniz has to say about that and then look at what, just briefly at what Du Chatelet has to say. And I won't say very much about that. Um, Jeff talked about it yesterday. Cho Lin has a paper on this. I want to spend a little bit more on time because um, on the topic of, spend more time on the topic of time because um, less has been said about that so far. So here is what um, Leibniz says about this issue of how we form the notion of space. He says, I will here show how men come to form to themselves the notion of space. They consider that many things exist at once and they observe in them a certain order of coexistence according to which the relation of one thing to another is more or less simple. This order is their situation or distance. When it happens that one of those coexistent things changes its relation to a multitude of others which do not change their relation among themselves, and that other thing newly come acquires the same relation to the others as the former had, we then say it has come into the place of the former. And this change we call a motion in that body wherein is the immediate cause of the change. And supposing or feigning that among those coexistence there is a sufficient number of them which have no change, then we may say that those which have such a relation to those fixed existence as others had to them before have now the same place which those others had. And that which comprehends all those places is called space. So just to summarize all of what just happened, um, and I put it all there because there's kind of a lot going on and it's going to be important, some of it's going to be important when we come back to motion, but just to pick out the main things that are important for us at this point. So we observe an order of coexistence in which some relations seem to be stable and some se seem to change. From this we form an idea of place and of same place and that which comprehends all those places is called space. So this is how we get our idea of space according to Leibniz. Um, I think that, as I mentioned, Du Chatelet would have been sensitive to this issue of how do we get the idea of space prior to reading the leibniz clark correspondence. Um, I think that what we get from Leibniz just just if we just confine ourselves to the leibniz clark correspondence is kind of puzzling and incomplete and not, it's not kind of very clear what's going on. Um, and the story that she tells is, is very different from Leibniz. Um, so we saw a little bit of this yesterday, this idea that um, in order to get our idea of space, it's cru a crucial part of that is that we have to imagine something as external to ourselves, or we have to imagine two things as external to one another. This idea of externality um, plays an important role, and the, the, there's an imaginative function here, um, playing, um, enabling us to think of two things as external to one another. And this plays a, a key, this is a key step in how we get our idea of space, and that's something that we don't see um, in Leibniz, we don't see in Locke. Um, but as I said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Jeff has this. Um, nice paper on this, and, and Cho Lin has a paper on the, on the representation of space, on these steps that Chatelet is making in order to get to the point where we have um, an idea of space. So let's um, go on now to talk about the epistemology of time. I think this is really, in really, really interesting what's happening here. So as we already saw in the correspondence, Leibniz treats space and time in parallel to one another. And I think the same is true for Du Chatelet when it comes to the metaphysics of space and time. She just follows Leibniz, goes um, through in the same way. But I think it's not true for the epistemology. There are some asymmetries here that I think are interesting and that um, Du Chatelet brings out in her discussion of time. Um, and this is something that there's just no hint of in the leibniz clark correspondence. So this is one place where it's very clear that what she's doing is going is taking some issues that are present in the leibniz clark correspondence and moving the discussion forward in a particularly interesting way. Um, so let me start first with the parallel that there is um, between space and time and that's present in Du Chatelet. So both space and time, each of them provide a kind of structural unity to the multiplicity of beings as we experience them. So here's what she says about space. She says, since we represent to ourselves in extension several things that exist external to one another and are one through their union, all extension has parts that exist external to one another and are one 
and we represent to ourselves both par ourselves parts both diverse and unified. Uh, sorry, and once we represent to ourselves parts both diverse and unified, we have the idea of an extended being. So we get this unity of the multiplicity that Jeff was talking about yesterday, and I think we can think of that as a kind of structural unity. Um, and we have a, an analogous thing going on in the case of time. It's a little bit more complicated here because um, we're structuring non-coexisting as well as coexisting things. So we're structuring um, the successive parts, the yeah, successive um, things, things that occur successfully to one another, things that sort of overlap in time. She has this nice passage about this, and here's a small quote from that. It ends up by saying, our idea of time arises insofar as one gathers together these diverse existences that have successive existence as well as um, existence at the same time, and considers them as making one. So there's a parallel here um, between space and time, but then we get some um, asymmetries. Um, so as we noted just a moment ago, um, the idea of space depends on the representation of externality, of thinking of one thing as external to me or two things as external to one another. And the idea of time doesn't. Um, and I think we see this in Locke as well. Um, so she says, we would have a notion of time even if nothing other than our soul existed. She she's states very clearly that we don't get our idea of time from our experience of the motion of bodies external to us and that so long as there's a succession of ideas, we can get our idea of time. So this is an asymmetry that, as I just mentioned, I think it's, it's also present in Locke, and here it is in Du Chatelet too, where the notion of space involves this idea of externality, of something outside of us, whereas the notion of time doesn't. It's just sufficient that we just have our own, um, I, the, the flow of ideas in our own minds for us to get the idea of time. Um, so that's kind of around, it's not novel with her, but it's present in her. Um, and I think she does something really interesting with it because I think we have good reason to think that she sees the importance of this for some interesting stuff that's going on in the Principia, um, in Newton's Principia. So suppose that we think of spatiality as requiring this sort of externality um, um, as part of the origin of the idea, but temporality as being internal. Then this gives us a second asymmetry, and it's something that Du Chatelet is explicit about. Um, she argues that in experiencing the succession of our ideas, each of us has our own time, one that cannot be directly compared with anyone else's. So now this gives us a problem that she doesn't think that we have with respect to space. So in our communal activities, whether we're just talking about ordinary life or, importantly, for Du Chatelet, talking about doing physics, this requires us to have a shared measure of time. And she says that this means that we've been obliged to take the measurements of time outside of ourselves. So, for example, we use the daily motion of the sun around the Earth as a clock. But, and here's a problem, there is not and cannot be a very accurate measurement of time for one cannot apply a part of time to itself to measure it, as one measures extensions by pieds and toises, which are, I don't know if I pronounced that right, inches and feet, which are, perhaps, which are themselves portions of extension. Each has his own measurement of time in the quickness or slowness with which his ideas succeed each other. So the upshot of this is that the measurement of time poses some special challenges that's not, that are not present in the measurement of space. So the measurement of space, the thought is, look, I can just you know, have these rulers and we all have those in common. This is something that the measure is external to us, space is external to us, it's communal in some way. Um, whereas in the case of time, we have a different issue. So time is something that is individual to me, and then we have to have these external measures and in, so in setting these up, there can kind of be a, there can be a mismatch between our measures of time um, and time itself, um, if you like. Um, and this is an issue that we also see in the Principia. I kind of go um, in the right direction. So in the, in the um, scolium to the definitions of the Principia, we see there the same thing, that the measurement of, of space is unproblematic, but Newton's very clear that the measurement of time 
um, that there can be a gap between absolute time, in, so that this is in the way that he sets things up, between absolute time and our measures of absolute time, and he explains why that is. So there's this asymmetry between space and time and the measures of space and time that's already present in the Principia. Um, so I think in this, the, the quotes that I had from Leibniz in his fifth letter, also in this um, epistemological asymmetry that's present in Locke that she would have been aware of from the reading of the Principia, the access to that that she had, there's this really interesting kind of conflux of issues about space and time, the epistemology of space and time, the measurement practices for space and time that are not clear, they're kind of, they're lurking there. And as far as I can tell, she's the first person to begin to sort of tease these apart and make them explicit. And that makes her extraordinarily important and interesting um, for the um, kind of trajectory of these issues. These are things that didn't get sorted out until the late 19th, early 20th century um, in terms of restoring some kind of symmetry and understanding that this asymmetry is a mistake. Um, but she's the first to kind of really begin to pull those apart. So I find this enormously kind of interesting. So that was space and time. I said I was going to talk about motion as well. Um, so I'm going to move on swiftly, having put that in front of you about time, move on to talk about uh, motion. So given what I take to be du Chatelet's swift endorsement of relationism about space and time, we might expect her to do the same with motion and just swiftly endorse a relational account of motion. But here things are not so straightforward. Um, first of all, as people in this room will know, um, Leibniz's own position in the correspondence is, isn't particularly clear. Um, and de Chatelet's views are even more confusing, at least at first sight. So now what I want to do is just talk a little bit about motion. Um, so here is, we saw some of this before, this um, um, Leibniz on motion. So the first part of this quote where he says, motion does depend on being possible to be observed. There is no motion when there's no change that can be observed. And when there is no change that can be observed, there is no change at all. Um, that part is the part that philosophers of physics typically pick up and use as their way of characterizing these two positions of absolutism about motion and relationalism about motion. And what nobody in this room, but um, philosophers of physics will typically do is ignore what happens next. It's just confusing and who would want to say that? Um, and just like set it to one side. But this is, as we know, if we read mo more of Leibniz's um, writings, enormously important. He says, I grant there is a difference between an absolute true motion of a body and a mere relative change of its situation with respect to another body. Okay, so that's not relationalism as philosophers of physics like to think about it. Um, for when the immediate cause of change is in the body, that body is truly in motion, and then the situation of other bodies with respect to it will be changed consequently, though the cause of that change be not in them. It is true that, exactly speaking, there is not, one, there's not any one body that is perfectly and entirely at rest, but we frame an abstract notion of rest by considering the thing mathematically. So there's clearly more going on than um, in that first paragraph but Leibniz doesn't give us a lot more to go on in the leibniz clark correspondence. So if you're de Chatelet and all you've read is the leibniz clark correspondence, this is going to look a bit puzzling. So what does she actually say then? Well, she says, here's her definition of motion, motion is the passage of a body from the place that it occupies into another place. Well, that's not very helpful, because that could be either absolute or relative motion, depending on how you define place. So what's her definition of place then? Is it absolute or relative? So if we look in chapter five on space, we see her say, we call the location or the place of a being its determined manner of coexisting with other beings. Thus, when we pay attention to the manner in which a table exists in a room with the bed, the chairs, the door, etc., this is a passage we saw yesterday, we say that this table has a place and we say that another being occupies the same place as this table when it obtains the same manner of coexisting that the table had with all the beings. This table changes place when it obtains another situation with respect to the same things that we regard as not having changed place at all. So this looks very much like her definition of place. It's a straightforward relational definition. And, oh good, you know, now it's all cleaned up. She's just a relationalist when it comes to the metaphysics of things. But that 
not how it goes because the next thing she does is to define absolute motion. So the first time in 2014 when we were reading this, I'm just scratching my head going, is she just completely confused? What on earth is going on here? Absolute motion is the successive relation of a body to different bodies considered as immobile. And this is real motion and properly so-called. Okay, so now you've just told me, given me a definition of absolute motion, which I understand in terms of absolute space, and you, it's a relational definition of absolute motion. What, what this, she's, this is the, surely this is just confused. Um, then we get a, we end up with a three-way, a tripartite set of definitions for motion. The next thing she does is give us a definition of common relative motion. So, okay, we've got a distinction between absolute and relative motion, but the absolute motion is defined as a relative motion, so it's head scratching. Um, common relative motion is that which a body experiences when, being at rest with respect to the bodies that surround it, it nevertheless acquires along with them successive relations with respect to other bodies considered as immobile. And this is the case in which the absolute place of bodies changes through their relative, though their relative place remains the same. And this is what happens to a pilot who sleeps at the tiller while his ship moves, or to a dead fish carried along by the current of water. So common relative motion seems to be when you have a bunch of different things that aren't moving with respect to each other, but they're moving absolutely. They're moving with respect to some other bodies that are, we're using as our standard of rest, given how she defines absolute motion. And this is to be distinguished from proper relative motion, which is that which one experiences when being transported with other bodies in a relative common motion. One nevertheless changes one's relations with them, as when I walk on a ship that is sailing, for I change at every moment my relation with the parts of this ship which is transported with me. So now I've got my stuff, all my stuff that's moving together, and then I'm moving with respect to those things, and that's going to be the proper relative motion, the relative motion proper to an individual body that's moving with respect to this group of things that are in absolute motion because they're moving with respect to bodies that we take to be at rest. This terminology, I think, she took from Muschenbrook. So he has the same terminology, he has a tripart distinction, um, but he believes in absolute space. So for him, absolute motion is motion with respect to absolute space. So she seems to, he, she seems to have taken Muschenbrook's terminology and repurposed it for whatever it is that she's trying to do with motion. So this is a, a kind of side comment. You've heard me mention Muschenbrook a few times. I think that if we're trying to think about her sources and think about who she's in conversation with, um, then we do need to look at the text that she says she herself read and read carefully and read during that period in, you know, prior to sort of the middle of 1736 where, they were where she was reading everything that she could in relation to Newtonianism. Um, because there's all this, these, these other books by Muschenbrook, Scraps, Andy, people like that, who are working through this Newtonian material, and that's how she's teaching herself some of this material. And they're also responding to what they see um, coming out of the Leibnizian writers and, and the Cartesian tradition and this kind of thing. So there's already, so these, I think these other sources are equally important, and we should be looking at them too. So she seems to have taken this terminology from him, as far as I can tell. Um, but transformed it to do something different. So what is she trying to do and why? Um, so we've got our three different kinds of motion. Absolute motion where the reference bodies are considered to be immobile. Common relative motion where you've got several bodies moving together absolutely. And proper relative motion where this body is, where you have a body that's not only moving together in absolute motion but also changing its relations with respect to those bodies, why would you need all these three things? And I think that, unlike Leibniz, I'm going to say, um, du Chatelet, I don't know why I'm looking at you, you're my, my like Leibniz knowledgeable person. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, just, did you say? Um, Leibniz, I think du Chatelet really appreciated the demands that Newton's account of absolute motion was designed to meet. Um, and I think we can divide that challenge into three. So there's the sort of ontic challenge that we need to have a distinction, um, that we're looking for a distinction between true motion, the true motions and the apparent motions. So we're engaged in this common project of trying to identify 
what the true motions of the bodies are, whether it's the Earth that's moving around the Sun or whether it's the Sun that's in motion. We're trying to determine the true motions and distinguish them from the appearances, from the apparent relative motions. That's the common project. And what resources are we going to need in our, in our metaphysics or in our ontology in order to make that distinction? So that's one thing. And I think that, Leibniz, that Du Chatelet just sort of follows Leibniz kind of quickly, and she's not particularly... You know, that's not where, her, where she thinks the issues really are, right, where the problems are that she's interested in dealing with. I think she also sees that there's a conceptual challenge here, that there's a challenge of cons constructing a concept of motion that's adequate for the purposes of a theory of bodies in motion. So she sees that what Newton is looking for and what he's providing us with is a concept of motion that adequately relates when a body is in motion or undergoing changes of motion to the presence or absence of forces, ties these different concepts together and ties them to empirically accessible motions and forces um, in ways that allow us to develop a theory. So she's understanding that we need an adequate concept of motion for the purposes of this kind of project. And she's also um, aware of the epistemic challenge of, okay, well, how are we going to find out um, what the true motions are? What kinds of resources do we have available to us, including um, the observations of the apparent motions? How can we find out what the true motions are? And Newton, one of Newton, the things that we get from Newton is, look, you've got to get the concept, the concept set up right, you've got to get the conceptual challenge met in the right way in order to make the epistemic problem um, tractable. Uh, we have to get our relationships between the presence and absence of forces and the kinds of motions and changes in motions that bodies undergo, we have to get those relationships set up right in order for the epistemic challenge to be something we can meet. And that's something that Newton wrestled with for a long time in the process that leads up to the Principia, where he solves this problem and is able to determine the true system of the world, able to determine the true motions um, of the planets, for example. So I think she's sensitive to all of this, um, and she's sensitive to the epistemic problem that Newton leaves, you know, is it states very clearly that having committed himself to absolute space and absolute motion, he has a real problem when it comes to finding out what the absolute motions are. If the true motions are the absolute motions, there's an issue because we can't observe absolute space, so we can't see these motions directly. And he says, it's certainly very difficult to find out the true motions of individual bodies and actually to differentiate them from apparent motions because the parts of that immovable space in which the bodies truly move make no impression on the senses. So as I said, the problem is that the motion of a body with respect to absolute space is unobservable because absolute space itself is unobservable. So I've got these, you know, he, he's claiming that he's got things set up in such a way that we can get access to the true motions, but there's this issue that we might not be able to get all the way there. Um, so, what's Du Chatelet's response? Um, so, and this is this comes from work um, with Cho Lin. Um, all this stuff up for, about um, motion, Du Chatelet on motion, comes from that paper. Um, and this is the key passage, I think, um, in Du Chatelet. She says, "We perceive that a being has changed location when its distance from other beings, which are immobile, at least for us, is changed." Thus, we made the catalogues of fixed stars in order to know whether a star changes location because we regard the others as fixed, and indeed they effectively are relative to us. So what is absolute motion for her? We said, she said that it's um, motion with respect to bodies that we consider to be immobile. So she's looking at what Newton's actually doing and all the astronomical work that goes into succeeding, improving the results and obtaining the results that Newton obtains in the Principia. And all of that depends on these observations that are made with respect to the background of the fixed stars, so the constellations that keep in the same, stay in the same fixed relation with respect to one another as they move across the sky. That's the map of the fixed stars relative to which we plot the motions of the, of the wandering stars of the planets. Right, so we've got our fixed bodies. That is sufficient 
for us to do everything that we do in the Prinkipa. It has to be, that's all we have access to. So she's looking at saying, what do we actually need? What do we actually do in practice? What do we actually have epistemic access to? What we have access to is to the absolute motions, the emotions with respect to these bodies that we consider to be as at rest. And that's enough for this. It might turn out that we need to pick different bodies for different purposes, um, and that's fine too. We might turn out that we're wrong about certain things, but that's all in keeping with her general philosophy of science, right? where she, you know, she's, she thinks that we're fallible. She thinks that we can, you know, we do the best we can with what we have, um, but nothing, you know, we can't prove things with certainty in the empirical um, realm. So I think, in fact, that although what looked like very puzzling kind of claims at the beginning where she seems to define absolute motion in terms of relative motion, she's exactly right in terms of pinpointing what the resources are that we're using in order to solve the problems in the Principia. And this enables her to overcome some of these sort of lingering difficulties about the notion of absolute motion. And whether that goes beyond the resources that Newton actually had available to him. Um, so, again, I think this is, you know, a hugely kind of important step in thinking about in the aftermath of the Principia and in thinking about how philosophy of physics that um, moves forward in the mid-18th century. Um, so, all of these things about space, time and motion, they matter because you shout it, it's just interesting, um, but they also matter for this, the, the overall story that we tell about the unfolding of these issues in the history of philosophy, because what she's doing is taking central issues that we see in the leibniz clark correspondent and moving them forward in really new and important and significant um, ways. And also what she's doing was highly visible, so as um, the work of, uh, of Ruth and people associated with the centre have done so much to show, her work was highly visible at the time and also gets picked up in the encyclopedia, as we know, and there's some really interesting things there about which claims about space, time, and motion make it into the encyclopedia and which don't. Um, put that to one side for now. So I think her work has just this very important place in the narrative about absolute versus relative space, time, and motion. It runs from the correspondence through to Einstein and beyond. Um, so that's the kind of first part, the forward-looking and I have much less to say about the second part of what I said I would do. Um, but yeah, this is the stuff that I get really excited about on space, time, and motion in her. Um, the second reason it matters, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is the second part, is um, because of the leibniz clark correspondence being this very early source of Leibniz's ideas for Du Chatelet. So if we're thinking about how her thinking develops, how it unfolds, if we're thinking about the chronology of that, then I think it's very important to go back to the leibniz clark correspondence and remind ourselves about what's in there and what's not in there. Um, so just to remind you a little bit about the um, timeline, so here's um, William Barber. So he says a few things that I think make it very clear that it's very likely that she'd read the leibniz clark correspondence by 1736. So um, Voltaire's personal contacts with both Clark and Des in London can hardly have failed to stimulate his interest in the Le leibniz clark correspondence. So he probably had a copy. Du Chatelet's earliest known reference to Newton, uh, which was highly pro-Newton, of course, was in late 1734. So we've got this period from 1734 to 1736, which seems to have marked the peak of purely Newtonian enthusiasm at Cire. Um, and by the end of that year, Voltaire had completed his elements, as we know, Du Chatelet was heavily involved in that. Um, and he also says that Du Chatelet seems to have read everything she could by Newton during this time, including some pretty really kind of eclectic pieces. So it seems highly likely that she would have read the leibniz clark correspondence. So she would have at least have been exposed to all the rich variety of Leib Leibniz's ideas that we find in that correspondence. So I think it's important that we go back and look at what was actually in it. Um, so here's, yeah, just a whole lot more. These, I think everybody in this room is familiar with all these things that um, um, the original um, permission for publication says that um, she offers an exposition of the principles of philosophy of both Leibniz and Newton. Um, so I think 
everyone here knows that timeline. So what was in the leibniz clark correspondence? Um, so as a philosopher of physics, I know it most for uh, dis the discussions of space, time, and motion, also of gravitation, of conservation of motion, of whether the total quantity of motion in the world is conserved or not, with Newtonian saying no and the Leibnizian saying yes. Um, discussions of collisions, especially hard body collisions, these pose particular puzzles depending on which side of the debate you're on. Um, discussions of living force, as you all know, um, this is a debate that Du Chatelet revitalized. Um, so there's a whole discussion between Leibniz and Clark on that. Um, discussion of human free will, these are all things that as we know, um, she was thinking about and um, that her views were evolving on um, in the late 1730s. So early on in the Foundation's manuscript, for example, she says, in the end, and this is, she's thinking about um, collisions, in the end it seems to me that it is no easier to conceive the simple communication of movement between bodies supposed to be completely hard than to know what their forces will be after the collision. One must, I think, leave both questions to God. So at this time, she's fine to um, just say, well, you know, if we can't find it out, when, well, you know, just God just does it. And this is a, that's kind of an uncharitable, but it's a characterization of a standard sort of Newtonian Clark kind of line. Well, yeah, gravitation, God just does it. That's an explanation for things. Um, she is very late, willing to concede only that Leibniz is right about living force and not about much else. Um, and she's very concerned with free will. So one of the things that was on the previous slide was um, Frederick's attempts to engage with Voltaire on the topic of free will. So presumably they were discussing that at Cire. And she writes to Maupetri saying, but the only thing that puzzles me at present is liberty. So by now she's, she's converted, as we see, to thinking about living force. Living force is supposed to be conserved as the quantity of motion in the universe. But that worries her for the consequences that it seems to have for free will. The only thing that worries me at present is liberty, for in the end I believe myself free, and I do not know if this quantity of force, which is always the same in the universe, does not destroy liberty. Initiating motion, is that not to produce in nature a force that did not exist? Now if we have not the power to begin motion, we are not free. I beg you to enlighten me on this point. So she's worrying about these issues when we see her views, um, how her thoughts, you know, what we would think about as being in terms of physics, so living force, all that kind of stuff, directly impacting these concerns, these discussions on free will, they're all closely interrelated for her. And these are issues that are already present in the leibniz clark correspondence. Also discussions about God's relationship to his creation and discussions about how we should reason, what's the proper way to reason about all these things. So, as everyone in here knows, um, Leibniz, um, uses the principle of contradiction, PSR, the principle of identity of indiscernibles um, in the leibniz clark correspondence, and there's this discussion between Leibniz and Clark about whether or not appeal to God's will counts as a sufficient reason. And um, here are some passages um, on that topic. Um, so Leibniz says, um, he introduces PSR in this way, he says, in order to proceed from mathematics to philosophy, so to go we, go, we need another principle beyond the principle of contradiction, as I have observed in my theodicy. I don't know if anyone in here knows whether Du Chatelet would have had access to the theodicy and when. Um, that's a question I'd be interested to know. Um, I mean the principle of sufficient reason, viz. that nothing happens without a reason why it should be so rather than otherwise. And therefore Archimedes, being to proceed from mathematics to natural philosophy, in his book on equilibrium, was obliged to make use of a particular case of the great principle of sufficient reason. And this is how he introduces PSR. This is the first um, instance we get of it. For he takes it for granted that if there be a balance in which everything is alike on both sides, and if equal weights are hung on the two ends of that balance, the whole will be at rest. It is because no reason can be given why one side should weigh down rather than the other. And then famously, Clark responds by saying, it is very true that nothing is without a sufficient reason why it is, and why it is thus rather than otherwise, but this sufficient reason is oft times no other than the mere will of God. So they're just kind of talking past each other, and as we know, as we saw Du Chatelet, she thinks that's fine uh, um, in the sort of 1737, 1738, 
but later, obviously, by the time we get the published version of the foundation, she's changed her mind about that. She thinks that, that won't do um, as a way of reasoning, in, um, at least in natural philosophy, anyway. There is another place. This is a kind of a side thing, but this looks like another place where she's just sort of following Leibniz in talking about PSR, because we get the same sort of passage. Archimedes, in passing from geometry to mechanics, recognize the need for sufficient reason for wanting to demonstrate that a pair of scales with arms of equal length, la, 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 the same thing about the balance. And then she says, Monsieur Leibniz, who was very attentive to the sources of our reasoning, took this principle, developed it, and was the first who stated it clearly and introduced it into the sciences. It must be acknowledged that one could not have rendered the sciences a greater service for the source of the majority of false reasons reasoning is forgetting sufficient reason. So it looks like, you know, one might think if one just picked up this passage, oh, she's doing, you know, a similar thing where she's just following Leibniz in this. But in this case, that would be a mistake because this passage about Archimedes comes very far into her discussion about PSR. The way that she introduces PSR is different from how Leibniz introduces it and her discussion, motivation, justification for it comes prior to this passage and then she says, oh, and also Leibniz. And I think that's um, an important thing to pay attention to. So when we're doing what I did at the beginning and going, oh, look, you know, very similar Leibniz Clark correspondence, what Leibniz says, um, what Du Chatelet says, we have to pay attention to where in her argument those are being placed because it may be, it may be doing something very different for her compared to what it was doing for Leibniz. So that's just um, a note about method, I guess. Um, so other things that come up in the leibniz clark correspondence, pre-established harmony, simple beings. These are already there and being talked about. Um, so he talks about pre the beautiful pre-established art order. He says, the word pre-established harmony is a term of art, I confess, but it is not a term that explains nothing since it is made out very intelligibly. He explains what he means by it. He talks about simple substances, true monads. Um, he says... He says, for God needs only to make a simple substance become once and from the beginning a representation of the universe according to its point of view, since from thence alone it follows that it will be so, perpetu be so perpetually and that all simple substances will always have a harmony among themselves because they always represent the same universe. So we've got simples, monads, we've got pre-established harmony, we've got, um, from there he goes, um, he goes on from that to a discussion of free will. So all of this is really just to, you know, I have nothing significant to say about any of these topics except to say, if we're going to do this, we should really go back and look at everything that's in the leibniz clark correspondence. Um, there was a lot she was already aware of that she could draw on, and I'm going to try and wrap this up very quickly. Also something that um, Sarah Hatton in her paper on Du Chatelet and the leibniz clark correspondence reminds us is that what's she referring to in this? She's probably referring to this collection by Des Maizieux, who I mentioned earlier. Um, so the leibniz clark correspondence, those letters are collected in these two volumes. There's a lot more in at least volume one, which is presumably what she had, and there's a second volume with a whole bunch of stuff in. So if she was familiar with the leibniz clark correspondence, and if so, if, if that familiarity came through this, then we need to look at what else is in volume one. And we should also wonder about whether she had volume two and think about what's in that. And volume one, at the very least, has a really long preface which talks about space and time, sets things up as this dichotomy in the way that she does. It, has, it talks a lot about the calculus dispute, it talks about pre-established harmony, talks about free will, talks about all these other issues, um, and presumably she, you know, I think we could think that she probably at least looked at the preface if she had these letters. So again, more materials that we ought to look at if we're going to do this chronology. So let me finish um, by saying I think it's a good time for us to be reflecting on the methods that we're using when we're having these really nice workshops that Ruth and the Centre are organising where we're looking at Du Chatelet in relation to other philosophers. Um, because there are different ways of doing this and it would be good if, you know, and I'm not saying there's only one right way, but it would be good if we could be more explicit about the methods that we're using. So if we just look back over the recent decades, we've seen 
One method was to say, oh, what she's doing is doing translation. Let's have a good look and see whether her translations are any good or not. We know that that's right, that that's not the right way of doing it. Um, and one reason to think that's not the right way of doing it is just to look at everything else that she does um, other than just translate passages. I don't think I need to dwell on that. Um, a second thing that there is in, the, in recent decades is to think about, well, what her text is in the foundations. It's an integration of different sources. Um, that's better, but it also leads to the kinds of errors of where we say she's misunderstood um, the stuff on motion. She's misunderstood the sources she was trying to integrate. For example, in this case on motion, where it just looks puzzling to start with, and then you look at the possible source, and she seems to have just misunderstood what absolute motion is. Then you just miss all these new and interesting things that she's doing. So I think we've all moved beyond that to be thinking about Du Châtelet as having her own philosophical project and to be trying to treat her work sort of on its own terms as her project. Um, and then it's good, of course, to look at what she had access to, but it's a much more difficult challenge than just picking up passages as the first two kind of methods allow you to do, because you've really got to have your sort of your own understanding of what you take it, what you take her to be doing in her overall project, because what a particular passage means, of course, depends on the use that she's making of it. We can't understand what a passage means in isolation from the overall project. So we are taking on a lot more work, it's a lot harder, um, but I think it's the right thing to do, and I think that's a lot of what's going on in the work of people in this workshop, so I applaud you for doing the harder work, because I think it's worth it. That's it, thank you.